Hello again and welcome back to The Daily Rundown with me, Dan Morfitt. Now, Regina De Giovanni is a textile researcher and a member of Manchester's Ancient Egypt Society. Now, Regina, you're here to talk to us about socks. I am. Socks? It's socks from 1,700 years ago. Heck. Kind of old to find under your bed. These aren't a thousand year old socks, are they? These ones are replicas of there's one little child sock on display in the Manchester Museum in the Ancient Worlds Gallery. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with this sock back in the 1980s. Um, there was a sock very deep inside a cabinet and I could never really quite see it. And it said it was made through a method called Sprang. 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 Who knows what Sprang is? I now know it's a netting. A form of netting textile technique, but it's not what's made this. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, the new curator at the Manchester Museum rejigged that exhibition and the sock came off display for a while, so it was accessible. And I went to an event at the museum where Anna Bunny, the community engagement person there, invited people to try and replicate the sock. And on the day, nobody quite managed it. So you'd always had a, an interest in Egyptology? Well, I have a sitting guild in textiles that I did in the 1980s, and I used to haunt the museum, trying to find things to replicate. And uh, then in the 90s, I did a degree in comparative religion, and I majored in Egyptology, and I keep that interest going through the Manchester Ancient Egypt Society. So what made you look at these socks and just think, they're there, they're an ancient artefact, but how the heck were they made? Like you said, nobody else could knit like this, but... Well, I saw the original artefact, and I saw when I saw it up close and personal, I really believed it was made of knitting. So I spent a couple of days with the artefact, and... I developed a pattern which looks more than a little bit complicated, doesn't it? So this is, this is beyond the world of knit one, purl one. This is mathematical. Yes, yes. This, this is stitch for stitch, row for row, a replica pattern of the sock that's at the museum. So I made a replica out of knitting. I, I'll, I'll just hold it up a little bit more just yeah. so people can see this at home. Just in case, they're knitters and they're thinking, well, yeah. can I make these little things? Of course. It may take you 80 hours to do one sock, but give it a go. And how, how long did it take for you to do one, one of these socks? Because that's pretty complicated. I, I, the first one just took forever because um, I was knitting in the round. I had... I think you've got a photo somewhere of the sock. Okay, well, yeah, we'll just take this photo with, of the sock. With lots of needles, where you have four needles and you knit round in a circle. That's the original. That's the original one that you did. That's the original. And then we've got the copy. And that's the copy That's there. the copy, which is very, very close to it. So, Coptic socks. So why are they called Coptic socks? And uh, that's an era of ancient Egyptian history, and it's around the time when the Romans were involved in Egypt. Um, the original sock was found in a Roman fort near Dendra, which if you know your Egyptology, is near where Cleopatra's temple is. And uh, we've had great discussions as to whether it's a Roman sock that was found in Egypt, or whether it's an Egyptian sock that was found in a Roman fort. So could there be a chance that the Queen of the Nile, Cleopatra coming at you, could have worn these socks? Or maybe Mark Antony as well? Uh, slight stretch, slight stretch, but maybe, we don't know for sure. And, you know, when you think back upon those times, I don't know if it's a misconception, mm. but you think of sandals and uh, yeah. strappy sandals. Why socks? Well, uh, it's got two toes. Uh, Japanese people have two-toed socks because they wear them with um, sandals with, like our flip-flops, mm -hmm. there's a central post. A bit, yeah. So uh, there's a catalogue of Coptic <laughs> footwear. and This is like the Freeman Hardin Willis of Egyptian days. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, 
the um, history shows us that the socks, the sandals had a peg. So you'd wear the socks between your toes on top of these sandals. Yeah, you'd wear it like that. And in the in the nicest way possible, mm -hmm. it's a load of Egyptian cobblers. <laughs> exactly, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. And, and by the sounds of it, as well. You know, the, the desert is very, very hot and arid and, you know, wearing these socks would actually protect you from the really hot sand, from the ravages of the winds. It actually is quite a great solution. And the sand is not particularly forgiving. Mm. It's not what you'd find on an English beach. It's very rough. It's very gritty. So you would need some kind of protection for your feet. And like you said, you know, these dinky little ones for children, mm. you know, take about 80 hours. Um, this isn't, this isn't just the only technique that they use there, I believe. I believe there's another technique that you've well, taken on, which goes beyond knit one, pearl one, and knitting with one needle. It certainly does. Now, um, I give you this. did my socks and forgot all about them. And then I got an email from uh, Dr. George Budalis in America, who's a, um, a book curator of ancient books. And he asked me to produce a pair of these socks using something called tarim stitch. Uh, tarim stitch produces a fabric which is very, very light knitting. Mm -hmm. Let's take some of these pins out. So it has the V chevron. Yeah. And the back. Has oh wow! So it's a different. The back. It just looks like ordinary knitting, but it's made with one needle. And when you're making it, when you're working away from yourself, mm -hmm. the needle is pointing at you. Mm -hmm. And when you're working towards yourself, mm. the needle's pointing away. And this is it's a very confusing. This is a ridiculously tight uh, stitch. You know, it's still quite supple, still quite pliable, but really, really tough. So I'm guessing that these socks weren't your usual thin ones that you get from down the market. These they lasted. would last. They would last. And um, I've spent the last six months getting this far. This has taken six months of work. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to unpick it then. Yeah. So um, luckily, this doesn't unravel like knitting. You can pull it and tweak it, and it stays where it is. And this, was, this technique was new with. to you as it well? It was new to me. Um, I searched high and low. I was sent um, an article from 1972 to work from, uh, which was a dry academic mm -hmm. article. <laughs> And I was scratching my head. So I searched the internet and I found a lady in Finland had put up an instruction as to how to do this wow. stitch. Um, so then I had an issue of tension. Do you know what tension is in yeah. knitting? No. In knitting, um, no. <laughs> depending on the size of your yarn and the size of your needle, you get a different size. So this is the exact same pattern, but this one's smaller than this one, ah, because so that, I used different size needles. So that determines the size rather than yeah. the plan. So I've been searching for different size needles mm -hmm. um, wow. to work on this. And I was looking for someone to make me a flat wooden needle. Um, unfortunately, let me see if I can find it in my bag. With this as well, you're bringing back techniques that may have been really common a thousand years ago, but oh, yeah, yeah, nobody's yeah. really practicing now. So you're keeping no. a skill alive that had all been but forgotten. It's, it is rec resurrecting techniques. Mm. Um, I have a problem of scale. <laughs> but like you said, that differentiates between the sizes of the socks. Absolutely, on the needle between that you're the using. fabric that you can get. So I have managed to find a wooden flat needle on the internet and it's on its way to me from Belarus. Wow. Where's Belarus? Oh, it's a former uh, Baltic state, uh, Russian state. So it's, it's really weird that there's a, a guy in New York emailing you. You're working here in the Northwest of England. Belarus are making your needles and it's all from Egypt. Yes, what so I, it's fantastic, the internet, isn't what it? What I love about these socks, you know, with this really, really uh, tight uh, part to it, and these, is that they're not too dissimilar in colour and um, Excitement. tone to that. Exactly. So they weren't, they weren't boring Egyptians, were they? they no, they not had at a, all. They had a love of colour. It is interesting. There's a single colour red pair at the V&A. 
there's um, some men's socks made, I think in this method, uh, at the Petrie Museum, and they're all single colours, but the examples for children's socks, they're all in little stripes, and they're just so charming, aren't they? And, and um, we'll probably talk about it another time if you come on again, but in your bag, you have uh, yeah. a piece of equipment from the Roman times that can I knit, do. let's call them knuckle protectors. Shall we look? I, I just want to see this knitting device. This is the craziest knitting device you have ever seen. And I know this you were saying is... to me earlier on, there's a person who <gasps> whose whole academic career is, is based on this be being a stargazing implement and you've disproved that by knitting with it. Well, maybe he's right. Maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> it looks like it looks like a, a landmine. You know, one yeah. of those sea mines yeah. that they had in the war and it has different size holes all around it. So, each hole is a different size for different size fingers. Do you oh, want to try? Yeah. So this is basically the start of a Roman glove and, well, and a Roman finger protector. This, are, this artifact came to me from a guy called Martin Hallett, uh -huh. who's on YouTube, and he made, he made one of these, uh -huh. and he sent me this, saying, please finish the glove. <laughs> so it arrived in the post, and I was very excited to see this. So I started knitting, and this is a very poor example, I have to say. Oops. So what, what we're seeing right now, basically, Deximus Massimus, Russell well, Crowe in Gladiator probably could have worn one of these. Well, talking about international collections, uh, the clip that shows that this can be used to make this came from a uh, centurion reenactor in Italy. Wow. Who I know on the internet. So he sent me the clip. I contacted the guy on YouTube. So, I've borrowed the artifact. Uh -huh. I've made it. And the guy's saying, finish the glove, because he's expecting it to come up to the fingers and cover mm -hmm. the hand. But I made it as it was, and I sent a picture to the reenactor and said, what would you use that for? Is that it? And he was as ecstatic. He said that it would protect the knuckles underneath articulated armour. Wow. So what, what's lovely about all of this, Regina, is there's these skills from Roman times and Egyptian times over a thousand years ago, and you're not just resurrecting them, you're continuing them and, and teaching other people. Absolutely. Regina, thank you so much for coming in tonight. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to uh, the Manchester uh, Ancient Egypt Society as well, because um, this is really, really interesting stuff. It's and this is lovely. Right, next, Zia and Eddie will return with their something to say. So please, come back in three minutes. <laughs>